This milk comes from the Jersey cow, the cow known for producing the richest, creamiest milk in the world. It's also known for its beautiful fawn-like features, its gentle demeanor, and its value as the family milk cow. This breed originates from the island of Jersey, one of the Channel Islands in the English Channel. The breed has been kept pure because of import restrictions on the island of Jersey. No other breeds can be imported into the island. And so the breed was shipped all over the world to people who wanted that rich, creamy milk for their families. Now, it seems from what we can find that the cow that was exported from the island originally was what we know today as a mid-sized cow. Some of these cows have been bred up to be bigger, the standard size jerseys we know today. Some have been bred down to be smaller, probably through the use of mixing or crossing with the Dexter cow, which is a naturally small cow. However, the records are far and few between. We haven't been able to find either shipping records or breeding records that go all the way back. And so it's a bit of a guess, but there is one farmer that knows a little bit about these cows and their history, and we've enlisted his help to tell us as much as he can about these little miniature jerseys. I came out of the womb loving Jersey cows, and almost 60 years later, I still, they are, they are my favorite. You want to come in? Do you want to come in? Come on. When you have cows, they have to be milked every day. So your life becomes based around the cow, around milking times and feeding times, because if the cow becomes the most important thing, and my whole life, biggest part of it has been based around a cow, or a milking, or a feeding, or something that needed to be taken care of. And uh, it's just, it's a way of life is what it is. So, it's a good life though. I have seven cows out here. Sometimes we refer to them as girls. Sometimes we refer to them as ladies. Sometimes we refer to them as things that we probably don't want to record, <laughs> depending on. If you only have an acre or two, you should have a smaller cow, which stands to reason. That's another reason why these little jerseys are still as uh, marketable as they are today, is they are a small cow. They're easier to maintain. They're easier to handle. A lot of women like to deal with these cattle. They don't feel so intimidated by a small one as opposed to a full-sized cow. Even small children aren't as intimidated with them as what you... Some of the standard jerseys of today are 50 inches, 52 inches tall. They're huge, huge animals. And now, if you get a 42-inch one that's only this tall, then that's more doable. Richard Gradwell contacted me many years ago and asked me if I would be the breed chairperson for the miniature Jersey breed. I was the run, one that wrote up the breed character, the breed traits, and the rules and the regulations. I, I put all that together, submitted it to him, and it was accepted, and that's the way it's been ever since. When I first started with these cows 20 years ago, there was no registry. There was nobody that kept any records on these cows or anything. Whatever got bred, got bred, this, that, one thing. Nobody wrote really anything down. And that's just 20 years. There's no way to prove that anything is pure because if we picked it up 20 years ago, we don't know that it was pure. And you, yes, I have bred Jersey to Jersey to Jersey to Jersey. To, and you would probably get seven A's, 15, 16 or even a little bit more like that. Some of them cut it up in fractions and stuff. The internet today is full of people that say that they're selling purebred miniature jerseys. Well, I don't really think that there's any that are, quote, purebred. I think that there's a lot of them that have a lot of jersey in them. One thing I will say about as far as um, the standards that were set up, the standard for the 42-inch mark on the miniature jersey cows started with the American Zebu Association, and it kind of come across the board to the other cows. Richard Gradwell set it up that anything that was 42 inches or under would be considered to be miniature. Anything that was 43 to 48 inches would be classified as midsize. And back in those days, I said, these little jerseys that I have found and I am breeding, they were not 
bred to be 42 inches or under. They range anywhere from 40 to 44 inches tall. I, think, I don't think that the jerseys should have to carry the same qualification as these new breeds that you are introducing because these cattle have been being bred this way for many years, just the size. He said he couldn't make allowances for just the miniature jersey breed, so he had to do it across the board. I disagreed with that with him, but I never did convince him. There's nothing wrong with a 44 inch tall little jersey. They're still quite small, they're easy to milk, and they're easy to handle. So I don't really say, but I didn't get my way on that one, I'll say it that way. Which I would have liked to, but I didn't get my way on that. So, so I've had to live with that. The miniature Jersey Bulls, most of the miniature Jersey Bulls up today are 42 to 44 inches tall. And I still believe that that should be classified as a miniature because if you look at a standard Jersey Bull up today, they're 52 to 54 inches tall. And if you think about in life, the male is always, most always larger. And why is it that way? Because it's easier to breed the animal. It's access. When I take the time to look at the websites out there, very few people actually have a miniature jersey, meaning that's 42 inches or under at maturity of three or three and a half years of age. They're all mid-size animals. Now, that said, there's not a thing wrong with a mid-sized jersey. They milk just as good, they can be just as gentle, and they can be just as friendly as, and they can make you a wonderful family cow. But let's tell it like it is, if it's a mid-size or a miniature. And then it all comes back to the pricing again. People will ask more for a true miniature jersey and they will command a higher price if it is everything it's supposed to be. Whereas the mid-size would bring maybe half that price. And it, there comes into the dollars and cents of it again. Everybody kind of learned a little bit of the marketing thing because uh, the International Miniature Cattle Breeds Registry, Richard uh, Gradwall was, was the founder and in charge of that, and he had a degree in marketing. So he, he taught, he was a professor, he taught marketing. He was just one of the ones that crossbred a few of the uh, standard jerseys with smaller animals and then they put it out as a miniature jersey because somewhere along the line, I'm not sure quite how that worked, but if it said miniature jersey on it, it's gonna bring a better price than if it says jersey on it. In regards to the miniature jerseys being polled, 20 years ago when I first started looking at these little cows, most of the ones that I saw did not have horns. I ask about that, why do they not, did you have them dehorned? No, they just didn't have horns. So when people say that their jersey, their miniature jersey, it's always that quote, miniature, has horns, immediately a flag comes up to me and said, well, recently, in the last few years, it has been crossed with another uh, a standard jersey that did have horns to bring in some either some different genetics or because that was what was available at the time or another one of these people that come out and say I have miniature jerseys for sale which really aren't miniature jerseys but they advertise them as such. But having horns does not mean a cow is pure in any way shape or form because you can buy a scrub cow at a sale barn that's got horns that's crossed with three or four different things so that doesn't mean anything. So people that say that they have purebred miniature jerseys based on a horn, that doesn't work that way. After I had crossbred the jerseys with my Dexter Bull, I never was satisfied with it. I had several of them because I had done it for two, three, four years, had two different bulls in there. I couldn't get rid of the dark color. The black color from the Dexter was prominent. It was turning everything dark colored. And that still is in some of the quote jerseys of today because it's got a little Dexter in the background because it was black. That pulls through because that gene is a strong gene. So I had one breeder from Ohio come and she bought all the crossbreds I had. She bought them all. And then I took that money and then I went and I started going around buying a little jersey here, a little jersey there. I got them from several different states, from several different breeders, some long time breeders, some that just happened to find them or just came across them at a sale barn. And I put all those together and then I, just, I found a miniature jersey bull that I would breed them to and then that's how I started breeding some of the ancestors of these that are standing out here. That's how it got started and that's been 
Oh, it was in about 93, 92, 93 when I was doing that, and it's been about 20 years now. And this is what I have done by selective breeding and by culling not just what they refer to as a cull cow. I mean, I culled some really good cows because I thought if I'm going to get my name out there, you can't just sell the stuff you don't want. You have to sell a good cow. So sell the good ones. Sell good ones. Let people know that that's a Dexter Corner cow. They'll see it. Who they're going to call? They'll call Dexter Corner and say, I want one like so-and-so's got. See, I've worked real hard to get what I do have today. And I've let a lot of good cows go in the last few years because my cows are well sought after. My breeding program here, as far as the cows go, I like for my cows to have calves in the spring of the year, usually April or May, and I like calving season to be done with by the end of June. That way, all my cows are milking at the same time. When the cal calving time comes, I'm always there, and I, I don't go anywhere during the calving time. I just feel like I want to be there. If, I, if they don't need me, I don't, I don't mess with it. But if they do need me, I'm usually right there. My cows all know me. They're not anxious when I'm in there, even when they're in labor. I can sit right next to them. Nothing worse than waiting nine months for a little calf, and then the calf comes and there's a problem, and then you get a dead calf. That's, the, that's not good. All my cattle wear collars. They come over here and they learn to stand tied. They also learn that I can grab them by the collar and lead them, and put them just about wherever I want to do it. And we go through training on a regular basis, a couple times a week, maybe three times a week they do that. And you do that for the first six months. That gives them their basic tra training. And then even after that, for the first year or so, you still have to bring them in periodically so they keep in that mode so you have control over the animal, especially if you're raising young bulls. Cows aren't quite as bad. This is my barn lot. The cows come up here and I have this little hay feeder over here. And then I also have two or three round bale, bale feeders out here. What grain I feed, I don't feed a lot of grain, but what grain I do feed, they go in these two feeders here. And I try to move them around, especially in the winter time, so they don't make such a mess in one spot. This red shed here, this is where most of my cows sleep at night. I let them stay out there in the cow ports, I call them. They're actually carports, but I've converted them into cowports. And they stay out there in the day, and then at night, they come up here and then they all lay in here, and then it's a smaller area, and I, I feel like they stay warmer. Now, whether they do or not, we don't know. But they don't complain. How come your eye is watering today and your eye is closed? Did you poke yourself on a stick? Huh? Did you poke your eye? Sometimes some of that hay that I feed has got some stems in it and they get all rustled down in there trying to get to it and they'll poke themselves in the eye. Then they, then they got a weepy eye for a day or two and you have to keep an eye on it so it doesn't get infected. in the winter time. I don't have to feed them as good a, quite as good a quality of feed as I do in, when they're producing milk. Now when it's really cold like it was this last week, I do give them some grain to just to warm their stomachs, if you will. And they have about as much hay as they want to eat. Uh, I try not to overfeed hay that they end up wasting it. I usually feed them what they'll clean up and then if they're still looking around for something to eat, I'll give them something else. But uh, I try to keep the waste down as much as possible. That's another reason why I don't feed the big round bales because they have so much waste on a big round bale because they'll just keep pulling it out, then they're standing on it, and then it's like 30% of it is wasted. And if you feed them from the little small squares, you can put in two beads of hay, and they'll clean it up. Then if they want some more, you can put in two more. Then you don't, and then you don't have all that waste.
I keep the cows on about three acres of ground. That's because that is what is, I have fenced behind the house where I can see them at all times. My workstation in the shop is set up so that I can look out my, look in my mirror and look out the back window and see the cows. I always keep them in mind. Um, that way I know where they are and if they're okay. Um, that's not near enough pasture for the amount of cows that I have um, out there, so I supplement with hay all year long. I, I have free choice hay for them. They can eat it or they won't. When the grass is good, they don't eat too much. In the winter time, then that's all hay. I like to feed grass and hay at the same time because when the grass comes on, especially this in the spring of the year, it's got a lot of water in it and it makes the cows real juicy. And if you're milking a cow, you don't want them to be juicy. You want them to have a, you want them to be firm. And that's important because that's like a big deal when you're in the milking parlor. You want a nice firm patty as opposed to soup. And if you feed hay and grass along with it, then that keeps them um, firm. If you keep a nice little patty, it's easy to clean up, see? It's all about the poop anyway, you know? The way my pasture is set up right now, I have two paddocks, and one's about uh, an acre, and the other one is a two acre plot. And I let the cows go out on the one acre for a couple weeks, and they'll eat that all down, and then I'll take and I'll put them over, move them over in the other pasture, and then it'll take them about three weeks to eat that down. But by the time the three weeks has gone by that they're eating on the larger paddock, then the second, the smaller one has had time to the, the grass to come back. She should have all that winter hair sh shed off. It's just that uh, it's actually Cinco de Mayo today, isn't it? Yes, it is. May 5th. And uh, usually by the f in 1st of June, they're usually all shed off pretty good. And they get brushed every day, trying to get rid of some of that hair. And the cows will stand in line to get brushed. It's just like a process when I go out there. They will fight each other off to see who's going to get brushed first and the longest. I usually turn the cows out on the pasture about the 15th of April. This year I didn't turn them out until the 4th of May and it made a lot of difference. It gave the pasture a chance to grow. We got a little better stand right now. Um, I turn my cows out on the pasture a little at a time the first week or so until they're used to it. I'll do three hours and then maybe four hours and six hours and then within a week's time they're used to the grass and I don't have any problem. In some areas, yes, they do have a problem with that and you have to be careful because it can, can cause a cow to bloat and bloat is not a good thing. I've talked to people and said that they had cows that they turned out on pasture and they bloated and they died. And I don't want that, so I just kind of watch them and make sure that... Yesterday I let them out for three hours on the pasture, and when they came in, they all looked like hippos. Their bellies were so big, and I thought, well, I think that was enough grass for you for today, girl. There'll be some more tomorrow. My father-in-law always, if he had a cow that would bloat, he would put a rope through their mouth so that they had to keep their mouth open, a thick, a heavy rope. And he would say they need to chew a rope. And actually they chew on the rope, but it keeps their mouth open for all night long. And then that gas comes out that way, see. But if you have one that's really bloated, then you need to get something done with that right away. In my opinion, poking a hole on it, let that gas out, that's a last ditch effort that you need to do that right away. But I've never done that, but I've seen it done. Thank goodness I didn't have to do it. I 
I do use mineral. I, I feed a free choice mineral. It's just a basic mineral. I mean, it has um, everything that a normal mineral would have in it. I feed it free choice. If the cows want it, it's there for them. Sometimes they'll eat it, sometimes they don't. It has a salt base to it too, so I think mostly that they're craving the salt. I can't tell you exactly what is in the mineral, but it's just a, a basic cow dairy ration type mineral is what I use. Usually within two or three days after they're born, I take the calves away. This way I can control how much milk each calf gets and it reduces the chances of getting scours. I've been feeding for the first six weeks of their, the calves lives, I feed them three times a day instead of twice a day. A lot of people just feed twice a day. I give, I give them the same amount of milk, but I divide it between three feedings. That keeps milk in their belly and keeps them a little happier. And th they don't scour as easily that way. Try to keep them about all even. One's a little more. But since all three of these calves out here are all about the same age, I'm giving them about that much milk which is about a half a bottle twice a day, or three times a day, excuse me. And uh, and I can say a whole mouthful about these rubber tips on these things, but probably not a lot to do with it. And then, warm the milk until until it gets about 75 or 80 degrees outside I warm the milk for them because it just goes down it tastes it's a little bit better or I think it is then after it's 75 degrees or more outside it gets up to 80 and that then I don't warm the milk for them when I feed them at the noon and evening feedings because the, the milk sets out here on the counter it does not spoil in a day's time and uh, then I have it ready for them whenever they're ready to eat. I raise my calves on a bottle until they're three months old and uh, then I wean them and by that time they're eating grass and hay and grain and I offer hay to them uh, and grain and water from the time they're a week old they have access to that then some some of them are fast to catch on to it and some of them aren't quite as fast if their bellies are full of milk all the time they don't take to the hay and the grain as much as they would uh, is if they didn't have quite as much milk so since I don't give them quite as much at, at one time their bellies get a little, aren't really stuffed full, and then they have a tendency that they'll go ahead and try the grain, eat the hay, and then they'll start drinking water. When some of them are two, three weeks old, they'll start drinking water. All right, now, let's go out here and feed this other one. Where's the big nipple? These nipples, when you buy them at the store, they are, factory made does not cut it with me. The holes are too small for the milk to come out. It takes forever, it takes two days to feed a calf. The air hole that's supposed to keep the bottle come from collapsing is non-existent. And so you have to open that one up, cut this a little bigger so that the milk comes out. And you don't want to cut it too much because then it'll choke the calf. So moving on up to the front of the bar now to feed this other calf. There you go. Okay, now we have the what I refer to as the sucking frenzy because once they go into the sucking mode then that's all they want to do so 
and they want to suck on your pants, they want to suck on your clothes, they'll suck your finger. It's like they'll suck on a, a gate, a wall. It's like, seriously? I have to try to keep them in different pens. I know some people let their kids all run together, but jerseys are notorious for wanting to be what I recall as, as a sucker. They want to suck on each other. So especially after they have their milk, they have that milk feeding frenzy thing going on. They want to suck on each other and that's not good either. We don't want them sucking. So therefore they have to have their each individual little pens until they're done nursing. If you give them too much milk, they will, their tummy can only digest so much at a time. That's the reason I feed three times a day, because then if the tummy gets overloaded, that will, can cause them to have diarrhea, otherwise known as scars. Now this one don't mess around, she gets right with it. Give me that moo juice. Show me the milk. Yeah, come on. Right, here, there's more. No, no, true. Oh, here. Don't go so fast. Here. When I open those bottles up, those openings a little more, you have to be careful so they don't get choked. Then when they get a little older, then they're better. But they're, this one's quite young yet. She's just about three weeks old. Yeah, that was some tasty stuff, huh? Mm-hmm. Get it. Yeah. And see, I rub them because when a calf nurses, the cow will lick them all over, and that's how they get their loving from their mama. So if I do this, oh, look at how excited she gets. It's just like, I'm all over that. Rub me. Yeah, it don't get no better. You're getting a juice and a rubbing. Mm-hmm. So... I didn't name that little bull calf because he's not going to stay here. If I name him, if I if I name him, then I get attached to him. Please. I do not believe that all bull calves should be left as breeding bulls. Yes, I do believe that they should be castrated. Um, Usually by the time the calf is three to four months old, you can about tell what it's going to be. If it's not something that you want, then you should, I think it should be castrated and then you can always use it for beef. they'll get tired and then they'll just go lay down in the grass and they'll just be all calm and sleepy and this is the milking parlor 
I try to keep it as clean as possible. It gets a real good cleaning at least two or three times a year. And uh, I don't sell milk, but we drink the milk ourselves and I have friends that drink it and other family members. And so I want everything as clean as possible when it's time to milk. The cows come in right here. And then this is my little stanchion that uh, the cows come and put their heads in here and then we lock them in and I've had many people over the years take a, a design off of this and it seems to be work out quite well for them. I have a cow that's going to be fresh the uh, last of February or the first of March and then we'll start milking again. So, but with all this snow that we've had in the last week or two, I'm glad we're not milking right now. what I refer to as a fair weather milker these days. I've done it for about 40 years and now I like my cows to be fresh and when there's pasture they can be out in a pasture one thing or another and I'll milk them about five or six months maybe seven at the most and then I dry them off so that this time of year when it's sloppy and cold outside I don't have to go out and milk the cow. And Now there are there are drawbacks to that because then you don't have that fresh milk to drink but I've learned over the years that yeah I'm having to give up my fresh milk but it sure is nice not to have to get up there when it's zero and go out and milk the cow. These are my tie stalls and I can tie six cows up here usually I just tie the milk cows or the cows that are in milk here and I bring them in tie them get them cleaned up ready to go to get milked usually have hay in front of them when I, before they come in to get milked so they'll stand and then when it's time I just let each one of them come loose uh, and they'll, they'll just follow right in and they know right where to go to get milked and then when they're finished I can bring them back out here and stand them tight again and when I'm finished milking I let them all out at one time that way we don't have a this one's standing at the door and this one's trying to come in and we have a, a confusion with that. Right now in the winter time, the main thing that we do is we just try to keep everything fed, keep it as dry as possible, keep it as warm as possible, and uh, get through the winter time. Then when spring comes, then that's a whole new ball game. That's, I put beet pulp in there first. I soaked some beet pulp. And I use beet pulp mostly as a filler. And there's a little grain over the top of it to keep her satisfied. And soak that. I put a little more beet pulp on there. There you go. Now she should be happy. Some people milk their cows. They don't, they don't give them any grain. They just have them come in. They, the cow stands wonderfully. And, I wash that each individual teeth. Then I dry them off. <clears throat> I take my finger and I work that teeth right down into it so it doesn't get laid over. Now this is the thing about having a short cow. If you got them too short, it's not such a good thing either because ideally you want that claw to swing freely. When they're short like this cow, less than 40 inches, that's resting on the ground. It'll still melt, but it's easier when it hangs free. And that's what these boards over here are for on my older cows that have large capacious udders. 
they're too low to the ground to get a melt right underneath of them. So I pull those boards over here. The back feet stand on those boards. That raises them up about four inches. Then that claw can hang three of them. It takes about seven minutes for each cow, more or less. When I got my first milking machine, it was like heaven. I couldn't believe how much better it was. That squeaky noise, if it's not just underneath of there, just quite right, it'll suck a little air and then it squeaks, so you just adjust it. Now, if it was free flowing or free hanging, it wouldn't do that. But since it's sitting on the ground, if she stands over like this, then it kind of pulls it off and then it sucks a little air. You can see as the melt is going into the tank, tank, it's coming out of the other and it's almost completely empty now. See how floppy it is? About that, Each cow is different. Some cows carry more milk in their back quarters, and then there's some that carry this one particular, particular cow carries maybe just a little bit more milk in her front quarters than she does at the back. Or the teeth opening is larger on the back than what it is on the front because the front two are a little slower than the back two. I always make sure that I always check them every day to make sure there's no lumps or humps or bumps. Make sure everything's good up in there. I can just tell by feeling. Then you take it off. I saw a post the other day online and it said that they were letting the calf run with the cow during the day and separating them at night. And the cow wasn't giving much cream. And several other people posted underneath of the, underneath of that and one of the posts was, uh, the cow was holding up the cream for the calf. <laughs> well, that's not quite so. A cow has no control over where the cream is up in her udder. Now, people come up with funny things sometimes, but I thought that was funny. That uh, I don't think that cow knows that she's intending, uh, intentionally holding up that cream for that calf to come and nurse it. That don't, it don't work that way. You gotta keep the feet in front of her so she don't have to reach because they're spoiled. And while she's doing that, we'll open up this milk. And I'll show you how I do this. Take the suck line off of that. Set that up there. And there's the milk that we just got from her. We're gonna pour it into this bucket because I'm not saving the milk this morning. This goes to the calves. And how I can tell how much milk my cow is giving is, I take it up here and I put it right here on this scale. And it's just right at 20 and a half almost. The bucket weighs a, a pound and a half. So she gave a little over 18 pounds of milk this morning. So that's a little over two gallons. Come on, you want to come in? Do you want to come in? Come on. Same process, same song, second verse, same as the first, as they say. Right now they're pretty clean, so it doesn't take much to keep them clean.
calf is nursing, if the cow's not letting the milk down fast enough, the calf will butt the udder. If she's just about done milking or getting close, what I'll do is I'll kind of come up here and kind of bump that udder and feel it with my fingers. And if there's any milk that's in there, then that kind of moves it around and it works pretty good to get all the milk out of it. I don't, in the summertime when it's dry, or spring now like it's dry, I don't use a tit dip. I use, but I always put a, like a, a, a cream, this is utter cream, mostly just to keep those, the teats soft and supple. And I put it right on each one. That keeps them from getting cracked. It's been really wet here and muddy, and you have to wash them, and that kind of dries the udder. And that's just what works for me. Now, in the, if it's real muddy and sloppy, I do have tit dip that I use that is almost covers the, the end of the teeth, but it's not got a soothing effect on the other like this does. Come on. No, see? Come on. Here we go. So you have to do the thing. Come on. Let's go. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Come on, let's go. You're done. Come on. Let's go. Oh, seriously? Yeah, this is the milk that you just did. Yeah. Now hit the bucket. Hit it. Alright. You, right. you want to go out now? And she gives a little bit more. A little bit. Not much, like a half a pound more than what the other cow did. You can't come back in. I'm so over you right now. Well, they need some hay. The last couple years I have just milked once a day because I don't need that much milk. Milk comes as a supply and demand type thing. The more milk you take, the more cow, the cow will produce the milk up until a certain point where her genetics kick in and say that's all that I'm going to give. Milking these little cows is a lot different than milking a standard commercial type jersey because the standard commercial type jerseys are bread to, pr to produce anywhere from five, six, seven gallons of milk, eight even, a day. Well, if, it, if you have a cow that produces that kind of milk, you would probably have to milk her twice a day. But on these little jerseys, their potential would be to, to produce maybe three gallons of milk a day. Then you can, that's not too much that the udder can't support that. A lot of people have to work off the farm. So the one time a day milking comes in handy for them because then they can base their milking either in the morning or the night or whatever works into their schedule. If you're only going to milk once a day, then you should milk once a day at the same time every day. I also believe that when you're milking the cow, when you wash the cow's udder, then she lets her milk down. You can just almost feel the milk come down. I believe that after she lets the milk down you should go ahead and take all the milk and not just leave it hanging in there now i know some people do a cow calf share but i don't like that idea because if a calf is still nursing a cow that cow is going to have a tendency to want to hold her milk up she'll hold it for the calf it's not natural for a human to be down underneath of their milk but it's very natural for that cow to have a calf nursing on there so sometimes some cows will hold their milk that way I also don't like to let a calf nurse a cow because calves are always slobbering around on everything, you know, and they're eating grass and they're eating dirt and all this and they're slobbering it all over the cow. Uh, if the cow's not letting down enough, calves have teeth on the bottom, they can cut the teats. Then if you go to milk the cow and she, her teats have got sores or cuts on them from that calf nursing, then that's going to make it harder for you to milk because she's not going to want to stand still for you to milk because it hurts. When you hand milk, you don't have the same amount of pressure on the on when you're milking the teats because your hands get tired or they kind of cramp or one thing or another. When you first start out, you're just really going to town at it. Well, then as you go through, your hands get a little tired, you get a little slower, you have a little bit different uh, uh, pressure on the teat. That'll t cause the cow to kind of move and stand around. Whereas if you could have put the milking machine on, put it on it's got the same pulsation all the way through it so 
I am glad to have a milking machine. I would not want to have to milk cows by hand anymore. I can strip them out a little bit, but I did, I've been there, I've done that. I got lots of practice in that years ago. I do believe that raw milk is better for you than the store-bought milk. It's not been pasteurized, it's not been homogenized, it's not had the additives into it and, and all the words that you, I can't even understand, can't pronounce them. I mean, you don't need all that in it. 